The Center for Brain Health is the only center really in the world that's focused uniquely on defining the upward potential of the human mind. Mostly what individuals look at is what's wrong with your brain. Is it there an injury? Is there a disease? Is there stroke? How much capacity have you lost? What we uniquely look at here at the Center for Brain Health is how from very young to end of life individuals can build capacity. Brain health. That's what we're doing here. One of the biggest things that we're trying to do today is define what is brain health. Brain health is a superordinate category of health. It is a higher category than mental health, social connectedness, or emotional balance. It includes all of those. So if I'm going to make my brain healthier, I'm going to have multiple ways to do that. One way is through connectedness. Social isolation has had a toll on holistic brain health. So many of the things that we've helped people to do is to say, you know what, the one thing you need to do is to go back and build stronger friendships. Even when you've been in isolation, one or two friendships can do more for your mental health as well as your clarity. So we know that all of these interweave to support each other to make your holistic brain health better. When we look at our brain health index, that's part of what we measure. Connectedness is a really big push, pathway, to help you to thrive, not just survive. 50% of what people are doing today is actually toxic for their brain. 50% because they think that I'm just going to keep using it. And number one, multitasking. Multitasking is doing two things at the very same time that require your concentrated, deeper level thinking. So it's not that one thing you can do almost automatically and the other requires deeper level thinking. It's two things, like if I'm talking to you on the phone and I'm trying to type an email, that's multitasking. One of the things that I like to say to people, and they get this image, multitasking is to the brain like cigarette smoking is to the lungs. So I say, if every time you multitask, just go ahead and pull out your cigarette too, because you're destroying your brain. And it makes a difference. People think that it makes you do things faster. Research has shown that individuals are slower, the output is worse and they make more mistakes. So we've tricked ourselves in our societal belief to think, surely if use it or lose it is correct, then if I do two things simultaneously, it must be good for my brain and it's terrible. The second most toxic is probably constant distractions. In the workplace today, they have estimated that people can only stay on task for three minutes. Guess what? Three minutes, your brain cannot go to a deeper level reasoning. It can't innovate. It's constantly being changed to this, changed to that, changed to that. It is, it's phrased the neurologic connections so that it actually slows down the whole brain systems. One of the things that we challenge people to do when we teach our tactical brain strategies is to do two things concentrated during your brain prime time for 30 to 45 minutes and you do not allow any distractions, no interruptions, you will see that you will move your needle forward than if you worked on that for three hours with constant distractions. It will be finished in that short period of time. Anytime you can hyper-focus, clean your mind, no distractions, you go to a level of flow quicker and longer, and you'll start longing for it. Our brain needs to be reset throughout the day. We tell people, do five breaks, five minutes throughout the day, five times a day. So if you keep pushing through, your brain doesn't reset, and the level of what you're doing for a task, if you keep focusing, let's say you focus for an hour, two hours, 
if you don't take a break and really let your brain reset, you won't complete near what you did than if you stop and let it reset. One of the things that people ask me a lot is, is technology good or bad for your brain? And I say, yes, it is. It's really good and it's really bad because to our technology allows us to be constantly distracted. And you know, it's always, if it's even close, if my phone was just right down here beside me, and it, I would be thinking about it even while, you know, we're engaging in this interview because of what goes on. But technology allows us to download information that we used to have to remember. I mean, I would never go backwards with my technology. So it's not that technology's bad, it's just that we allow it to run our lives and we don't know how to break from it. People have become so addicted to their technology that if they have to do without it for even an hour, they kind of go crazy. It's like, you know, I feel like I've lost my best friend. Technology isn't the evil. It's the way that we let it control us. We don't even know how to vet what's what we should pay attention to anymore. So we end up being just a little micron thick in our thinking versus going deeper on a few things. So our technologies allowed us to have exposure to all this information, which is good, but it's also really bad. It's made us shallow thinkers. Many people do need medication to stabilize the brain that have different uh, mental health issues. But if I just give you the drug, then you become victimized. That's what you are, whether it's your bipolar, your schizophrenia, you're depressed with the drug, but what if it's yes this, but you can still work, you can still do well in school, these are things you can do. We've been able to show that individuals, when they get the medication, but do the tactical brain strategies to become themselves but better, they actually thrive more. They don't just survive. Take ADHD, for example, that brain sometimes loves to connect dots in different ways. And when it starts to innovate, it can focus. We were able to show literally individuals with ADHD, when they learn tactical brain strategies of innovative thinking, many of them were able to come off the drugs and their grades excelled. So it's just that as a society, we've become a drug nation. Many people may need a medication to help stabilize them. But if they keep using the brain the same way they were, they become whatever they were diagnosed with versus optimize the human potential that is ready to be challenged within. And that's what our brain science is showing people. When we think about activities that will actually build capacity, a lot of people say, well, I do crossword puzzles, or I do Sudoku, or now Wordle. You know, people are doing them, and I say, guess what? That makes you better at crossword puzzles and Wordle. But does it make you a broader thinker, more connected, more emotionally balanced? One of the most powerful cognitive activities you could do is acts of compassion. Especially acts of compassion with someone that you disagree with. Because it stretches the human mind for you to think how did they get there? I want to just be curious about it versus I disagree with you. But if I say, I really am curious to think, how did you get there? And try to find some common ground. What that does to your brain is it makes you an innovative thinker. It makes me open my heart up to think about someone else. I don't have to agree with them. But I am stretching it to connect with someone in a way that Right out of the box, I kind of disagreed with you, but I can at least begin to understand is that, okay, that is one of the most powerful ways to build a stronger brain. Not to mention, it makes the world a kinder place. Women carry the burden of brain health, but they also carry the mantle forward. They carry the burden because we are at higher risk, two times more mental health issues, depression, anxiety, three times more likely to be diagnosed with an autoimmune disease that affects the brain, 
four times more likely to have migraines. Two out of three people with Alzheimer's disease are women. So yeah, we need to worry and we need to do it way before menopause because women tend to be caregivers for people with Alzheimer's disease too. It's sisters, daughters, if, you know, if the woman has it. The thing is, and what was heartening for me, is we had three times more women sign up for the Brain Health Project than men. Women carry the mantle because they're proactive. They want to know what to do. They take their brain health seriously. They're much more likely uh, to do something about it. In studies that we've looked at, women at baseline are the same as men and they improve as much as men. So brain exercise, physical exercise, we actually did a randomized trial looking at the difference between what you get. And we found that people that use strategies for their brain, their brain changes faster, stronger, and longer lasting. Physical exercise, we worked with aerobics uh, clinic, and what we found was three times a week, 50 minutes aerobic exercise, it improved the hippocampus. It improved the memory center, and they actually got a bang in their memory. So when people say, I want better memory, I think, go exercise. Typically, what's projected is aerobic exercise three times a week. What I tell people is move as much as you can. Be as unsedentary as you can and move. I always say, eat, sleep, move your feet to add to your brain health. One of the most magic elixirs for the brain is a good night's sleep. So not only is nature important, sleep is like a little janitor inside your brain that cleans out the plaque and the towel, the toxins. We were, we've been able to show in randomized trial that people with mild cognitive impairment as compared to Alzheimer's and healthy controls, when they got better sleep, moved into the normal category. Mild cognitive impairment is people at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. People that get seven to eight hours of sleep think better, they have less anxiety, they have better emotional balance, and better social connectedness. Sleep is the most powerful thing you can do to make your brain healthy. Right now, there is so much stigma about the human mind. Because if you're going to get a checkup, why is it? Because you think, well, my memory's not as good as it was, or my aunt had Alzheimer's disease, or I wonder if I can think and reason like I used to. What we're trying to get people to do is if you will get an annual brain health checkup, you can not only find ways to, to use strategies to improve your brain, but you can literally catch things before they become full-blown clinically. So why wouldn't you get a checkup if we can now measure the upward potential of the human mind, not just detect Alzheimer's disease, but to see, is your reasoning as good as it was? Is your possibility thinking? What about your ability to stay emotionally balanced when your world is being shaken up? Or what about your ability to connect with other people? Is that the same, and can you make it better? That's why you'd get an annual brain health checkup. So what we're trying to do here at the Center for Brain Health is to have people have access to brain health measurements wherever they are. So it's got to be on technology. And when people say, well, what would it measure? It would be measures to look at innovative thinking, your ability to connect dots, to make different types of information, so your clarity of thinking. Can you make decisions is one. The second area is your ability to stay emotionally balanced. What is your happiness? How do you deal with depression? How do you deal with stress? Do you see possibilities of getting through that? So it also looks at that. And the third area that the Brain Health Index looks at is your ability to understand human connection. Do you have empathy? Do you have compassion? Do you have a higher order purpose that can really help drive your brain health? So what it measures, if you think about it, 
Brain health is a higher category of health. Typically, we have tended to silo our brain and we look at what is your IQ? Or what is your mental health? Or what is your emotional IQ? Well, what if all those work together to make you be able to thrive in your life? That's what the Brain Health Index looks at. All of these things that contribute holistically to your brain capacities. Our goal is to democratize where it's accessible everywhere. Right now, people can do it online. We have over 20,000 people enrolled who've done it. Every single state, 43 countries. How do you do it? TheBrainHealthProject.org. You take an index, it takes about an hour and a half. You need to do it in a week's time, so maybe you'll do it in 20 minutes, three different times. You'll get a coach that will interpret it and see and set goals with you for individual personalized goals, and then you'll have access to training to see if you can maintain where you are, but with hopes that you will want to be even better in six months.